Yes, good morning. Welcome to Gospel Hope. Let's stand together. Now this first song we have not sung for a long time, uh, but it's a really good one. So join in when you feel comfortable. It's an old hymn with some new modifications, but I'm sure you'll love it. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, enlightened, accessible, hid from our eyes, most holy, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, your great name we praise. Unrest. Unhasting and silent as life, not wanting or wasting, you rule us in might. Your justice like mountains, I soaring above all clouds with sharp fountains of goodness and love. Most holy, most glorious. Gospel Hope, delighted to have you here this morning. Uh, the song we just sang was actually written in 1862 by a Scottish pastor named uh, Charles Smith. I think that's right. I'm looking at you, Linda, like you will confirm that for me right now. So that would help me if you would say, yes, you are. You're absolutely right. Isn't that funny how we do that sometimes? You know, it's a reminder to us uh, that we are part of something that stretches back thousands of years. Uh, the gospel that we believe is not new. And the hymns that we sing, some of them are newly written, but many of them come from hundreds of years ago. And we share in something that the Lord himself brought to us. And... Uh, 
by faith. We have believed it like generations before us, and we carry on, and we look for his second coming. We're going to touch on some of that today as we continue our study of the New Testament letter, 1 Thessalonians, that the Apostle Paul wrote. We're just so glad that you are here today. Matt's going to come in a little bit and give more of a formal welcome to our guests who are here today, but I just want to say how delighted we are, how honored we are to have all of you here. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's just great to have all of you here. We want to turn our attention to God's Word, and in Psalm 150, uh, there are multiple reasons given for us, multiple words of exhortation to praise the Lord, and to praise the Lord with all that we are and even all that we have. And you'll see as we read through this passage of Scripture together that from uh, a variety of instruments we praise the Lord, but all of that really is what just flows out of our hearts. We want to read this together, and so we've broken it up. Men, you're going to read a verse, and then ladies, you're going to read a verse, and then men, and and there are only six verses, so uh, each group will get three. So you read the appropriate part as it comes up, and men, you join me here as we begin Psalm 150 with verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Many reasons for us to praise him, and we'll continue to explore some of those in the course of the service. Daniel Kaminsky is going to come and lead us in prayer, and we'll join our hearts with his. Let's pray together. Let's pray. God, I ask that this morning we will taste and see how good you are, how great you are. God, may we fear you. Lord, we ask that as we come this morning and we open your word and we sing these songs that, God, our hearts will join together, be unified, praising your name. God, you are amazing, you are wonderful, you are glorious. Lord, may our tongues praise you. May our minds be filled with thoughts of praise, honoring you. Lord, protect us, protect our hearts and minds this morning from the evil things that are around us and from ourselves. And so, God, may you be exalted on high, may you be lifted up, And all that's done and said, in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we uh, sing praises to our God? Cry. 
As Danny mentioned, we just want to say a big welcome for those of you uh, who are visiting with us today. For some of you, a service like this may be very familiar. For some of you, it may be very different. And uh, we know that it takes a step of courage uh, just to come through the doors and, and meet some people you don't know or find a spot at a place you haven't been. Um, but we just want to say thanks so much for coming. Uh, Daniel Kaminsky, who prayed at the beginning, is one of our pastors. I am, and Danny, uh, right up here, as well as a whole bunch of people who want to serve and help and uh, just be here as a community together. If you are a guest with us for the first time, or if you've come a few times and you're just resisting, uh, there is a blue card in the seat pocket in front of you. It's called Let's Connect. It's very simple. It's got four blanks on it. Uh, we would love for you to fill that out just so we have a record of your visit. We also have a gift on the back table uh, just to say thanks for coming. We will send you one follow-up email. We will not add you to a perpetual email list. Uh, you can choose to join that if you want to. Um, but if you would uh, fill out that blue card for us. There's also a how can we help card. Maybe there's an area where you could use prayer or something else. Uh, you can write something on there or uh, mostly for our church family. There's a sign me up card. Uh, you should use that once in a while if you want to, if you're part of our church family. But all those cards are there. If you could fill that out for us, uh, especially those of you who are here for the first time, we would be so, so thankful. We're going to change up our routine a little bit on Sunday mornings and move the announcements to this spot. So if you're a little like weirded out by that, that's exactly what's happening. And uh, probably will happen on most Sundays moving forward. We've been talking about it for a bit, but we just think it's uh, a little better this way. Uh, it gets pretty quiet around here over uh, the next little stretch, um, but in June, we want to let you know that in the midweek, our community groups have wrapped up as of last week, but we're going to do something called picnic and prayer. It's really simple. Uh, we go down to Riverton City Park, which is just about a mile, mile and a half from here, and uh, we find a spot usually by the pavilion that's on east, west, north, south side. Anyway, you won't be able to miss us. Um, we find a spot and uh, kind of hang out in the lawn and have a picnic time together. Each family's responsible for their own food. Uh, you can make something extravagant. You can grab it at a fast food place on the way in, whatever you want. Uh, but we just have a great time hanging out and encouraging one another, spending some time together. We spend about a half an hour doing that. And then we spend about a half an hour praying together. Uh, for our community, for each other, um, and that will start on June the 7th. There's nothing this week. If you want to have your own picnic at Riverton City Park this week, you can, um, but the picnic and prayer for Gospel Hope will start on June the 7th, and uh, we'll do that throughout the month of June. Uh, really excited about that. Um, and then for next Sunday, uh, we are going to have a second round of baptisms. We had a, some a few weeks ago. We have some more people who are ready to get baptized. So if you've put your trust in Christ, turn from your sin, uh, thrown all that weight on him, put your faith in him, and you're ready to get baptized. Next Sunday is an opportunity. Please talk to one of the pastors today. Please don't call us on Saturday and go like, hey, I want to do that tomorrow. Uh, we want to check in with you and just have a good conversation in the lead up to that, but uh, that is next Sunday, and we are very excited about that. It's interesting, in the last song we sang, there was a line um, that I've always been encouraged by, which says, basically, um, from God's hand, what he's already given us, we give back to him. And that's our spirit as we come to our time of giving. Uh, we'll have our ushers come forward in just a minute. But if you look, listen to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, this encourages us that even in hard times, the anchor for our souls is God's word and what it tells us about Jesus and his return. Listen to these verses before we pray and give. The Bible says this, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse deceiving and being deceived but as for you continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings with the bible which is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then these familiar verses, but we all need them on a regular basis. All scripture, the whole Bible, is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's have our men come forward as we prepare to give this morning. God, we want to thank you for the good work that you are doing in our hearts through your word. It is the rock, the fortress. It is the thing on which we stand. We're thankful that like rain or snow, it comes to us and does everything you want it to do. Please help us to have tender hearts, receptive. And Lord, please help us to continue to run to you even when things are hard. You've told us 
that to follow you in any age is to have hard things happen. It's to swim upstream from a society that wants to go its own way. It's not going to be easy. But we thank you that you have, through your word, given us what we need for our hearts to, to teach us, to get us back on track, to train us in how you want us to live, to instruct us. So please help us to be students of your word, not just to grow more intelligent in our heads, but for it to sink down into our hearts and change our lives. Thank you for this opportunity to give. May we give as a, a giant thank you for all you have done for us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
If you would open your Bibles, please, to 1 Thessalonians. That is one of the New Testament letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to the first century church. And we have begun a brief series in this little letter. And it will continue through the end of June. And we're thankful to have each of you here this morning. If you do not have a Bible of your own, you're welcome uh, not only to use one of the Bibles from the seat rack in front of you, you're welcome to take that with you. We would love for you to have a copy of God's Word. Uh, we believe, as we read just a moment ago, that every word of it has been breathed out by God. It is a living Word. Uh, it is a powerful Word. It's a life-changing Word. And we want to be people who know it, who love it, who read it, who obey it, uh, who feed our souls on it. And that's part of the reason we are gathering here today. 1 Thessalonians is the first of two letters that Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church. You'll find this particular portion that we're going to look at this morning on page 986 in, uh, in, your, in your Bible. Uh, so turn there with me. Be ready to follow along as I read in just a moment. Have you ever been separated from someone that you love and so deeply worried about them because of that separation and maybe a lack of information or communication that it became disruptive to your daily routines. Uh, Maybe you just could not concentrate on the things that were in front of you in the workplace. Maybe it even was so disruptive that your normal eating habits and appetites were diminished, uh, if not excluded. And, And you just said to yourself, until I know how this person is doing, I'm I can get on with my life. Well, this weekend we remember those who have given their lives in the multiple wars in our nation's history, and you can go back through the very personal accounts of families that have uh, had members serving overseas in these horrific wars, some even locally if you go back far enough in our nation's history And story after story, particularly in the old days, includes a lack of information about a loved one and living with that uncertainty. And some of you could probably tell stories in your own family experience where a loved one was serving and you had no clue if they were alive, if they were dead, if they were healthy and whole, if they had been wounded in battle or taken prisoner uh, by uh, an enemy force. And it was agonizing to your soul. Then you have the ordinary separations that inevitably come to our families, and some of you have children who are reaching adult age and actually leaving home. Sometimes they do that a little little bit early, you're not quite ready, and other times you're like, will you leave already? (laughs) But you know, most parents uh, miss those children, and for all that the empty nest is cracked up to be, it's, it's not as fun as some may suggest it would be, because those relationships are dear to our hearts. And parents who believe and trust that God is in it, it's time for my child to to leave the home. If there's not enough communication, begin to develop a certain level of anxiety and uncertainty and fear and doubt, and you wonder to yourself if they're eating well or if they're getting enough sleep, and you hope they remember to pay their bills and drive carefully and brush their teeth. Well, those are just different scenarios that involve a separation, a lack of communication, or a lack of available information about someone that is dear to the heart. And the Apostle Paul was in a similar position with the dear saints of Thessalonica. And over these first several weeks, as we've been studying through this New Testament letter, we've noted the history, even took some time to go back to Acts 17, that tells us how this church came into existence And Paul, if you'll remember, and his two partners in gospel ministry, Silvanus uh, and also Timothy, had gone to this city that was in desperate need of the gospel itself. And out of that gospel proclamation, a church was formed. But just three weeks in to this mission, this gospel mission and church planting effort, uh, a, a big riot erupts, as it were, and persecution unfolds, and those three men are 
hastily uh, sent out of the city before their lives are in danger. There are some of the saints remaining in Thessalonia, like Jason, as Acts 17 tells us, who suffered uh, at least a, a heavy fine along with some of his friends for being associated with these men. I mean, it was a really difficult time, and in short order, they're separated, and Paul and his team can't get back. And so we resume our reading today, and we want to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. And depending on how your copy of the scripture is laid out, you'll notice that this particular paragraph runs into the middle of chapter 3, and then actually another two paragraphs, and we're at the end of chapter 3. And that's going to be our portion for this morning. So you follow along as I read this portion of God's word, 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 through the end of chapter 3. The Apostle Paul says, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, uh, Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you, you yourselves know that we are destined for this for when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you, for this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Father, our hearts so often feel overwhelmed by our present circumstances and the unknown days that lie ahead that we must look to you. We look to you with all eagerness and expectation. We look to you in the way we just sang, looking back, first of all, to your life and death, to your powerful resurrection. We look back to the promises that you have given from of old that you would come again, and that causes us to look forward. Oh, how we long for your return, Lord Jesus. How we long to see you in your glory for that work of salvation that has begun to be completed as we are transformed into your likeness. And there's nothing of sin or even an imperfection that remains in us, but inside and out, from top to bottom, we will be glorified. We long for that day to come because these days are challenging and our own weakness and imperfection, our own struggles with sin are, are the, the great struggles of our hearts. <coughs> we ask that on this day, as we open the word together, that you, by your spirit, would instruct and teach us in what we should believe, in how we should live, and how we must submit ourselves fully to your lordship. I pray to your Holy Spirit that you would meet the very personal needs of all those who have assembled here today, even those who watch remotely in this hour. Spirit of God, would you bring comfort as it is needed? Would you bring conviction of sin 
as it is necessary. And would you bring the full assurance that Jesus Christ is all that he has revealed himself to be and all that we are in need of. Oh, how we pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you would draw near to us as we now draw near to you. It is in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now go back to verse 17 with me, and I want you to begin to see how God is at work I'm going to just tell you very frankly, as I was working through this passage this week, there were a number of things that were emerging, and they were encouraging to my heart, but there was still this little restlessness until yesterday afternoon, and it suddenly dawned on me that I was just assuming what's so easy to assume in a passage like this, but I hope will be really prominent, that what encourages Paul most as he thinks about these dear saints at Thessalonica is not that their faith is remarkable, not that their work and their commitment and their perseverance is amazing, but that a great God is at work in them and a, God, a great God is at work in him. So I, I, my prayer is that you will see it is God who is at work. Now look at verse 17. And we're going to take 17, 18, and 19 together as one little section. And I, I, I pray that you will see that it is God, actually, who is sustaining not just Paul's vision of, or the Thessalonian vision, but God actually begins to sustain our vision in this present day in a similar way. And he does it through a promise. Now look at verse 17, because Paul is, is actually speaking to the present circumstances of the Thessalonians and the distress it created for him. First of all, he says, we were torn away. And he uses a term, actually, that is used in other Greek literature to refer to making an orphan. There's a loss of relationship here, if you will. We were torn away. We were made orphans, as it were. We wanted to be with you, but we couldn't. And that's where he goes on at the second part of verse 17 to describe his frustrated desires. We wanted to be with you in person face to face, but, but that's not possible at this moment. And then verse 18, he mentions a satanic hindrance. I mean, it's one thing to say that circumstances just don't allow us to be together, but there's actually supernatural opposition to Paul and, and his team rejoining the saints at Thessalonia. We'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, those are the difficult circumstances, and some of you are living in very difficult circumstances right now. It's easy to get lost in those, even bound up in those things, and, and you feel hopeless or paralyzed. You, you feel a certain despair in that. But notice where Paul goes. In verse 19, he begins to point us to the promise of Christ's future coming. The little word for appears in verse 9. For what is our hope or joy? And that ties it back to the strong desire to be with them. What is our hope? What is our confident expectation that any good could arise in the middle of difficult circumstances? What would be the source of our joy? I mean, those things that actually cause us to be cheerful in the face of really difficult circumstances. What, what would be the source of that joy that would dispel the gloom that begins to creep into our souls and settle over our hearts or we just feel like, oh, it's heavy. I just have no strength. I don't want to go on. Then he says, what is our crown of boasting? Or some of your English translations might say, the crown in which we glory. And, and there's terminology here where it seems that Paul, and he does this in other places, right? He uses the athletic uh, terminology of his day, running races, competing in the Olympic events. Well, there's a word here that was commonly used to speak specifically of the victor's crown or wreath that an athlete would receive after winning a particular event. And Paul is saying, so what, what's our victor's crown in, in which we rejoice? I keep stepping on that. It's going to cause me to stumble here in a moment. How could Paul remain so confident of a future day of celebration when so much opposition and disappointment in the moment marked his life? It's a great question for all of us to think through and even wrestle with. Notice the truth, though, that stands at the center of this confident, joyful expectation. Here it is, his coming. Before we get to the victor's crown, you have to be sure that Jesus is coming. Now, this is the first of four specific references in this little letter to the coming of Christ. There's a specific term that we could also translate it as his arrival, his advent. First advent, Christmas. 
Second advent, it's this one that Paul's talking about. Jesus has promised to return. Now, notice, if you will, that he's talking about an event, though, that is before the coming of our Lord Jesus. And it's not a reference to time. There's not chrono- chronological before Jesus comes. No, he's saying in the presence of the one who has promised to come. There's, there's something that's going to take place. And what is going to take place? Well, this victorious celebration where crowns are distributed. But he's using this term, and he goes on to explain it. And, and when he asks the question, what is our crown of boasting? Well, look at the text. This is staggering. Is it not you? Wait, time out. Thessalonian saints, some of whom were only recently converted, like they're the prize? Absolutely. They are the focus of Paul's great joy and hope and expectation for the future. Then he goes on to say, you are our glory and joy. Oh, how different this is from most of the rewards and incentives that we work for in life. Most of us think in terms of performance bonuses. Like, that'd be a really great thing, right? You show up to work tomorrow, and your boss is like, you have been such an amazing uh, employee, and our company would not be where it is. And as I was thinking uh, about how valuable you are to the company over the weekend, I just felt compelled to give you a $50,000 check. (laughs) Hope it's a good week for you. (laughs) Now, could you go make a batch of fries? I mean, we, we're all kind of, you know, eager for that kind of reward to appear, but Paul's not talking about a material uh, benefit. He's not even talking about some of the things that God promises heaven will include. No, what Paul is focusing on is that the great joy of his heart, the great glory that he anticipates in that uh, coming of Christ is that he will see these Thessalonians appear in the presence of this Savior and Lord. And in that moment, know that the work that is only recently started is finished. That's what not only helps him maintain his sanity in the middle of a really hard moment, it actually begins to fuel things like his joy. Don't let the immediate circumstances of your life dictate your joy or your joylessness at this moment. It's easy to let the overwhelming circumstances, even satanic opposition, spread the gloom over your soul. To grow a kind of despair and hopelessness. It doesn't mean that you will live without tension in your soul. It doesn't mean that you will not have an anxious thought about those that you love, but you're not with at the moment, or you haven't heard from them recently, like Paul and the Thessalonians. But this kind of truth, this non-negotiable truth that Jesus is coming, and things are going to happen at his, at his coming, one of which, prim, one primary thing that will happen is that the work of salvation for millions and millions of people will be completed in that great day. Oh, that begins to, that begins to just feed your heart with faith and joy and hope. Parents, some of you who look at your kids right now and say, are, first of all, are they actually going to come to believe this gospel for themselves? You know, if you just look at where they are at the moment, you might actually become really discouraged. But if you begin to look at promises that fill this book and you begin to see the power of God at work, it begins to fuel your faith. I heard a grandparent say, just within the last two weeks, oh, I just fear what my grandkids are gonna live through. Can you keep that to yourself, Grandpa? You don't need to share that, Grandma. Why would I say that? Because the faith of your children and your grandchildren needs to be fed on the promises of God, not your doubts and fears. We need to open this word 
and feed on it personally and then serve it up to the coming generations. I know things are difficult in many ways and there are things that cause my heart to tremble as I read the headlines or look at the news, but I try to remind you often what, what the news outlets report today are not the eternally significant headlines, but promises like these. Jesus is coming and Jesus will have his victory, period. Now, look at the next portion, chapter three. God begins to strengthen Paul's heart and he, he strengthens our faith through uh, an ongoing work. You say, what, what do you mean? Well, look at verse 5. Paul goes back to the idea that just like the Thessalonians are facing genuine threats to their faith, and every generation does, let's not miss the fact that as God was doing a great work in Thessalonica in the first century and many other cities, he's doing a great work in our day. Now, let's take a look, though, at the threats because they are real, and, and we're not blind to them. Verse 3, Paul refers to uh, verse 3 of chapter 3, Paul refers to these afflictions. And then he goes on to say, you yourselves know that we are destined for this. Now, that, that's not encouraging on the surface. But there's an, there's an accompanying threat with this affliction, and he uses a term that, expre- that um, captures the idea and expresses the thought that there is some kind of oppressive state that the saints are living through. It could be a physical oppression, it could be mental, it could be social or economic. He doesn't delineate it here, but he uses a a term that is used in a a broad and various kind of way. The afflictions were destined for them. Matt read from 2 Timothy 3.12 earlier in the service where all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That would be an example of affliction. But what's the, what is the accompanying risk that Paul is concerned about? Well, look again at verse 3, that no one be moved by these afflictions. Now, this, this is more than just kind of a little nudge or a bump. To be moved is to be shaken so as to give up your faith. So you're moved off a place of faith into a place of non-faith, or replacement faith. Some of you struggle in that way right now. There are many faiths in in our world, but there's only one faith that God has laid out for us, and it is faith that is specific to Jesus Christ, to who he is, to what he has done by his death on the cross by what he has accomplished through his miraculous resurrection from the dead. What a game changer that was. So you could have great faith, but if your faith is placed in the wrong object or the wrong pathway or or the wrong literature or or body of, of teaching, that faith doesn't have power to save you in and of itself. It's the object of your faith that saves, and that's why the gospel is so critical to understanding this because the gospel tells us about a person. And Paul is concerned that the oppression, the affliction that they begin to experience would actually move them off of their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, here's a second threat. Look at verse 4. It's the oppression of evil. Now, in our English translations, we use the word affliction, but notice the word right before it, suffer affliction. We actually need two English words to capture the one term that Paul originally wrote to the Thessalonians. And it's in the same neighborhood. It would be a synonym for the affliction we just looked at in verse 3, but it's a different term. So, like, the, these terms are neighbors. If you drive into their cul-de-sac, you can go, oh, there's term one and there's term two, but it's not the same. They're different residences, if you will. This actually, when when you look at the way it's used in other New Testament scriptures, you would find that it is actually referring to the pressure or the distress that comes from some kind of source of evil. Let me give you an example. Uh, I mentioned earlier from Acts 17, 1 through 8, Uh, as the story is told of how Paul and Silvanus and Timothy were at Thessalonica and then they were run out of town. Uh, One of the members of the Thessalonian church named Jason and some of the brothers in that church were actually dragged before the authorities in Thessalonica and unjustly fined. 
Like they were given credit for stirring up the riot and they weren't the ones who stirred it up. It, it was actually the Jews who opposed this gospel work there, but they end up with the fine. How fair is that? It's not, it's unjust. That's the kind of affliction, uh, suffering affliction that Paul is speaking of. It's interesting in the second letter to the Thessalonians in chapter one, verses five through seven, Paul makes reference to the fact that God will make these things right. He says in verse six, God considers it just to repay with affliction those who've afflicted you. And he uses this term. So there are people behind it who are responsible for the affliction and God's keeping track. So even when we suffer an injustice, nobody gets by with stuff. God is the judge of the universe. He will make all things right one day. And Paul is encouraging these people saying, you have, you have suffered affliction, but God knows and he actually will repay those who've done this evil to you. Well, this unjust pressure or oppression being brought to bear on the church by others is a genuine threat. There's a third one. Look at verse five. And that is just the straight up temptation. He refers to the tempter who tempts you. And we know the kind of temptation Satan brings to us, and it's not just designed to make us stumble and fall. It's actually designed to overthrow our faith. One of my favorite authors who has been with the Lord now for a number of years, F.F. F. Bruce, wrote in his commentary on First and Second Thessalonians, the term implies temptation which had succeeded in overthrowing their faith. The clause expresses apprehension over what might be discovered by Timothy on his arrival. This is Paul's fear. Timothy, we haven't heard anything. Would you please go back? Timothy goes back, spends time. When Timothy returns, Paul's great fear is that Timothy will come back and say they've, they've lost their faith. They don't cling to Christ anymore. And you know, sadly, in it seems like there's been a wave in recent years of deconstruction stories, as, as they're often called. I mean, even, even pastors, church leaders who stood in places like this and proclaimed God's word, seemingly with great faith and confidence, who just kind of folded it all up, threw it away, and walked away. Some of you say, that'll never happen to me. Be careful. You grossly underestimate the power of the tempter. You know what's interesting in so many of these deconstruction stories that I've read? Typically, there is some kind of wound or hurt in the soul that's unresolved. And those hurts, when they're left untended and uncared for through Christ and specifically through his gospel, they will become infected and they will fester, and that wound will turn to frustration and bitterness and anger and hostility. And how often you have heard stories, as I have, of people becoming so angry with God, who is not the perpetrator of evil, that they just walked away. Well, what's the antidote to such affliction and temptation? Well, let's go back to the text because look at what Paul actually did. Go back to verse one of chapter three. When we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith. Now, now notice something here. This is actually God at work through human uh, instruments such as we are, through Paul, through Timothy, Thessalonians have a part in this too, but it's God who's strengthening in his church, and he does it primarily through the gospel. You say, where do you see that? Well, look at these verses a little more closely. First of all, God is partnering with people like Timothy. You say, where do you see that? In the term co-worker. Whose co-worker is Timothy? He's God's. That was one of those moments in reading and, and meditating and praying this week, it suddenly you know, jumps out at me like, wow. I mean, it's true that Timothy is Paul's co-worker. It's true that Timothy is, is a co-worker of the Thessalonians as they have come into the household of faith, but that's not what Paul writes. He is our brother, but he is God's co-worker. Everybody knows what a co-worker is. It's a person who participates in the same activity and, and work that the rest of the company. 
is engaged in. But God is at work here, and Timothy becomes a co-worker with God. I pause to ask, whose co-worker are you? Have you partnered with the God of the universe who is doing a great work in our world today? Or are you just all about your own mission and business? Well, I believe there's a God, but, you know, he's up there and out there, and I do my thing, and he does his thing, and we have a happy relationship. Oh, not really. Maybe you're a co-worker of the American dream. God is looking for co-workers. But look at what God does through his co-worker, Timothy. And this is why Paul says we sent this man back to Thessalonica to establish and to exhort. That is, we, we, we wanted you, through Timothy's partnership with God himself, to be made firm in the faith. That's what establish means, to make more firm. And the word exhort means to earnestly encourage and, and even a call to the, the, to the appropriate action to establish and exhort the Thessalonians in your faith. And what faith would that be? Well, he's just said in the phrase right before that this is all about the gospel of Christ. So again, we're back to that thing of it, it's not just faith in and of itself that we're trying to promote in a ministry like this, but it's faith in Jesus, in what the word of God reveals about him. <coughs> and and I, <clears throat> I want you to think for just a moment, let this just sit in your heart, that there are churches outside of gospel hope that need to be established and or exhorted in the same way. We need to be alert to the opportunities to participate with God in the same kind of work that Paul and Silas and Timothy and the Thessalonians were partnering in. Co-workers with God. So God is strengthening his church through the gospel, specifically the establishing and exhorting that Timothy uh, was serving them with. Now, look at verses 6, 7, and 8, because God is actually bringing comfort back to his servants, Paul and Silas, through this report of vibrant faith. And think how our hearts are encouraged as we hear reports of others that we have known growing in the faith. Verse 6, he says, the good news of your faith and love. Verse 7, he says, we've been comforted about you through your faith. Encouraged or consoled is the idea. And and. I don't have time to fully develop this, but part of what he, he writes into this letter when he says, you know, we actually sent Timothy to be an encouragement to you, but we're the ones who got encouraged as Timothy came back with this report. And then look at verse eight. Now we live if you are standing fast. Now we really live to know that you are persevering in the faith. The term for live here. Um, it dawned on me yesterday, I need to do a little more digging on this, but it, it's a little term, three-letter term. Uh, to put it in English would be Z-A-O. And as I was looking at that yesterday, my mind w- meant, went immediately to the Zao Asian Cafe. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that is a place where you can get food that gives you life. <laughs> I was hoping, that, I actually went to the website out of curiosity to see if they gave an explanation for why they chose this name. Because Zao, it... it in the Greek text, it's not Asian in the sense that we would think of that Asian cuisine that is there. So, you know, may, maybe there's no direct connection here, but Z-A-O, as I understand it, you know, from the scriptures means to live. And I was hoping there'd be this really great story that would tie in and make a beautiful sermon illustration to say, you know, this company desired to be a place where you could go and find life. And that's why they chose the name for their Asian cuisine. And they put it out on the billboard and let that be a reminder as you drive around the city that God is about bringing life. But there's nothing there. (laughs) It could just be pure coincidence that that name that they've chosen for their restaurant uh, does share the similar letters uh, that, that we would use to understand this. The most I found when I went to the website was an opportunity to fill out an application uh, to start a career at Zal, uh, and that page begins with the question, are you awesome? <laughs> and I guess if you can answer that question, yes, I am awesome, then you should continue and fill out their application. Well, in one sense, Paul is saying, you know what's really awesome? 
that God is doing a great work in you. That because of his work in you, because of his presence with you, you are standing fast. That gives us life. Despite the affliction, despite the oppression, despite the satanic hindrances and temptation, this work is continuing. Paul rejoices in that. Now look at verses 9 and 10. In response, Paul says, What thanksgiving can we return to God for you for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? It's clear there is thanksgiving. It's clear there is great joy that is emerging in hearing this report, and even this is attributable to God. God is the one who will receive the praise of his churches in the same way that Paul is saying, what thanksgiving can we return to God? He's not looking to praise Timothy because Timothy's such an amazing preacher and teacher of God's word. He's not even looking to praise the Thessalonians because they have persevered in the faith. He is aware that God is at work in extraordinary ways, ways that we can't fully see or know or even understand, but here it is happening. And that's reason to be thankful. That's reason to be joyful. What thanksgiving can we return to God for you for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God as we pray? And this leads us to the last portion. (coughs) He's using strong terminology for the kind of prayer. He's saying we are begging God for things that we we judge to be indispensable. That's what he means when he says, as we pray most earnestly, night and day, that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. But now look at verses 11, 12, and 13, and we'll wrap it up here. Because this is God fueling our prayers for things we have not yet received. But how does he fuel them? Right out of his promises. And and Paul comes back to the fact that Jesus is coming. Now look at verse 11. May our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. First of all, what's he praying for? Well, he, he is praying for present ministry with the Thessalonians. And we'll get to the part where he, um, you know, makes reference to the, the coming of Christ again. But there's more work to do. Praise God for what has happened. But because Jesus hasn't returned, that means time is left. There's more growth for us personally to experience, more churches to be built, more, more evangelism uh, to take place. And when he says we're praying that God would direct our ways, he's using a term that has the idea of making our path just straight. Straight as it can be. No unnecessary curves, no winding, no meandering. A privilege today to have uh, friends from South Carolina uh, visiting. They didn't plan this together, but two different families. Um, the Olsons on this side, the DeLuworks. Did I pronounce that right? Please forgive me if I didn't get that right. Good. Um, they will appreciate this. Uh, in, in Greenville, you can get lost uh, in a hurry because the road system is terrible. And the story is that when the city fathers long ago said, we need a road system in our town here in the upstate of South Carolina, somebody said, let's get all the livestock together in the middle of the city, turn them loose, and follow them with pavers. <laughs> and, and that's what brought about the road system in Greenville. There's no rhyme or reason to it. You, there's one road, and we lived on this road for a time. It has three different names. The same road. So depending on what part of the road, uh, it, it changes names. And you don't have to turn right or left for it to change name. There's just a point at one stretch where it becomes a, a different road. That can be slightly confusing, can't it? You can spend a lot of time winding your way around, meandering, looking. It, we moved to Utah uh, six years ago. And once I figured out how the whole grid is laid out, you're never lost in the valley. Now, you may never have been in that neighborhood or in that particular section of road, but if you can look at a sign and find what south and what east or west or north you're on, you're good. You're good. You're just good to go. Well, what Paul is expressing is our prayer is that God would just lay this straight road or pathway in front of us back to ministry with you. Time is short. Jesus is coming. 
We can't afford to be meandering aimlessly. We can't afford to encounter those hindrances uh, that would would inhibit the work of the gospel. And so Paul says, first of all, we pray for present ministry. And it's tied to the soon coming of Jesus. Now look at verse 12. They also pray for abundant love for one another. And again, because Jesus is coming soon. That love for one another is not only critical for churches to be healthy, but it actually is the hallmark of true discipleship. Do you remember what Jesus said? It's recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And then listen to what Jesus says. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I love the wise words of another Bible commentator and author named Gene Green. He wrote that the strong love for one another within the Thessalonian community was the counterpart to the rejection they faced from their contemporaries. There are a lot of people in Thessalonica who are not happy by what God is doing in this little group of people. And isn't it quite remarkable that the Thessalonians weren't looking to overthrow the Thessalonian government? They weren't even looking to overthrow you know, some of the other faith traditions that were around them. They just knew the transforming power of, of Christ dwelling in them and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And as they begin to share it and proclaim it, that, that's all it took to make a lot, make a lot of other people angry. What's sad, if you study the Thessalonian culture, though, you'll find that there was a lot of hostility, a lot of cultural friction in their day, and it it reads much like our own day. And I think that we should never underestimate the power of this kind of love for one another that really becomes a powerful counterpoint, not just to the rejection that we face as followers of Christ, but that actually becomes a powerful apologetic for the reality of Jesus Christ and the power of his gospel to change, to change families, to change marriages, to change whole communities, to move people from being so polarized and hostile and angry and tribal one with another, that there is this remarkable unity where you'd step into the middle of an assembly like this, and as you begin to hear the life stories, you'd say, these people are not at all alike in their human history. What has happened? Jesus happened. And so we pray, as Paul did, for love to abound. Verse 13, last idea. And we pray for the completion of our salvation so that we are ready for his soon coming. Paul goes on to say, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Love and holiness always run together. And you never pursue one at the expense of the others. Paul's prayer is that God himself would establish the hearts of the Thessalonians in blamelessness, first of all. What does it mean to be blameless? It means to be without guilt, without reproach. Is he saying, you Thessalonians better live a perfect life or else? No, God does call us to be perfect as he is perfect. But remember, he, he, he issues that call out of, out of this non-negotiable standing he's given us in Jesus. Remember, we looked at this specifically in Romans. took a long time there. God declares us to be perfectly righteous for Christ's sake when we come to him. And, and out of that position of security and stability, that gracious blessing, we're like, but I'm not a perfect person. He says, I know, but Jesus substituted his life Uh, for your life. So because of Jesus, I declare you to be righteous. Now go live like it. Well, that's tied into this prayer. Establishing our hearts, blameless in holiness. Holiness is just God's standard of purity. But holiness also refers to what has been dedicated to God. 
And beloved, I don't want you to miss the power of this point. God saved you from a life of slavery to sin and rescued you from the bondage that accompanies all of that sin, not just to turn you loose and leave you on your own. He actually saved you, saved you and rescued you and, and in all of that, it devoted you to himself. And he's done that with a view that one day when Jesus returns and we all stand in his presence and the victor's crowns are distributed, which are actually people and relationships, and yes, there will be other rewards, that he would get all the glory. It's all about him. What a prayer. What a comfort. What hope. We're confident in the face of present affliction because there are many promises, one of which is that Jesus is coming. We are encouraged to continue in ministry because if you look, not necessarily with these eyes, remember, but the eyes of your heart, you will see God is at work. You are testimony to that. Some of you came to faith in recent days. Others, a few months ago. Others, yeah, it's been years, but God, God reached down and said, you're mine, come to me. Turn away from your sin, leave all of that. Confess it, forsake it, seek my forgiveness, receive this gift of eternal life. You're the proof that God is at work. And we're inspired to pray as the Apostle Paul was praying because God has given great promises and he's coming. Would you bow your heads with me, please? At the moment, for some of you, the circumstances that are hard, even the affliction and oppression and temptation that you're experiencing seems to be the greatest power and reality in the universe, but it's not. It's part of the tempter's deception. He doesn't want you to think about the God of the universe. He doesn't want you to think about the Savior of the world who has been sent, becoming the, the creator, becoming human as you and I are, living a, a life of perfect obedience and then dying a death he did not deserve in order that people deserving of death like you and me might be rescued. The tempter doesn't want you to think about that stuff. But God in his kindness has brought you here today and given you an opportunity again to think about him. What will you do with Jesus? Will you submit your heart to his lordship? Will you turn away from your sinfulness? And will you put your faith in him and in him alone? Parents, grandparents, some of you are beside yourself with how rapidly this world is spiraling down and and you're not only discouraged in your heart, but you're actually becoming a source of discouragement to your children and your grandchildren. Will you confess that to the Lord today and say, Lord, I've lost sight of the fact that you are doing a great work in this world and Jesus is coming again and Jesus will have the victory for which he died. God, strengthen my faith that I might be a source of strength for others. Grow my joy. Grow my confidence. Some of you have already been praying about other ministries that we might be able to strengthen in the way that Timothy was sent by Paul and Silvanus to strengthen Thessalonica. Keep praying those prayers. There's so much that God is doing. Time is short. Jesus is coming. Father, will you take your word and seal it to our hearts? There's some here today that need to be rescued from sin and saved eternally. There's some here who need to be strengthened. Even some who personally are in danger of being moved off of their faith. Oh God, have mercy. May they see that 
as, as Peter said, Lord, where else can we go? You have the words of life. Oh, Father, speak to them. Speak to them out of your word. Speak to them by the power of your spirit. Convince them that you have the words of life and there really is no other alternative on all the universe. Lord, there are, there are hundreds of needs represented here in this room this morning. Would you meet every one of them in Christ? We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, in just a moment, we're gonna, after we conclude the service, take a little break before our equip classes begin. And if you would like to maybe have a follow-up discussion or if you're in need of prayer, uh, it would be my privilege and others who are here today uh, to do that with you. And I'd love to extend that invitation to you. I typically hang out near the front of the room here and others are scattered about, Matt and Daniel whom you've already seen and, and met briefly, so to speak, in the service, would be glad to speak with you. But you're among friends here, and uh, we would all count it a privilege to serve you however we could, so thank you for being with us today. We want to respond um, to all of this <coughs> in song, excuse me. Um, and so we're going to ask you to stand and sing one more time, and then Daniel will come with a little important update for us regarding some ministry changes that are about to happen. So stand with me, please. Let's sing together, Lift High the Name of Jesus. Before we uh, start singing, <clears throat> I just want to draw our attention to one, one little line that, uh, because of how fast I cause us to sing this song, you may very well miss. Um, in verse two, actually, Josh, could you throw it up there? Verse two. Uh, halfway through it, it says, to, next slide, to share the reason for our hope, to serve with love and grace, that all who see him shine through us might bring the Father praise. And while there's this, this, this anticipation for the future coming of Christ, um, right here in the present, um, we should be asking ourselves the question, do I cause Christ to shine through me? And do I make him more desirable and more beautiful um, to people around me, or, or less so? Um, so sing with me. Um, we'll praise the name of Christ here. Lift high the name.
Thank you all so much for those who've been willing to help with VBS and even make arrangements in your schedules to be helpers with VBS. Um, unfortunately, we believe that it's best to cancel this year's VBS, and there are several factors contributing to this decision. Um, the biggest factor is that we did not have enough volunteers to properly and safely staff this year's VBS. In light of all that is going on with the start of construction in just a few weeks from now, and personal travel and some big plant camp push that's coming around the corner. You know, perhaps God is actually showing us a different plan that will bring greater blessing in the end. We can trust him and expect in the unexpected changes that do come, though. Um, we intend to continue our summer's kids program next year um, and hope that you are able to participate. We do want your kids to be involved in gospel-centered outreaches this summer. And um, along with the Riverton Town Days that we have this summer, as well as plant camp activities that are around the July 4th, um, we recommend two alternative VBS options, and both of which are scheduled the end of June, June 26th through the 30th to be exact. Our sister church, Gospel Grace Church, they have a Back Your Bible Club activity that will be staffed in several locations in the Salt Lake City area, as well as a local church in Harriman called Awaken City Church that's running their VBS that same week. And uh, we do recommend um, those activities for your kids this summer. Um, but we do thank you again all who are willing to jump in this year. Um, and we are looking forward to what God's going to be doing this summer. There's a lot happening and we know that God has got this. And, um, and through all these things and these changes, um, we are excited to know that God is still in control and God's got this. And so we do recommend um, these wonderful summer activities for the kids. If you do have further questions or comments, please let me know. I'm happy to discuss those with you. Um, but we don't want to close the service on that. We actually want to close with this benediction Danny wanted me to read. It's in 1 Thessalonians from the sermon this morning. If you have your copy of God's Word, you can turn there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at the last verses there, uh, verse 11 through 13. And um, as I read this benediction, I, I want to encourage you this week that you meditate on this, um, of, of what was preached this morning and what God, is, God has for us here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless and holiness before our God and Father. At the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. I hope you can stick around as we start our equip classes here in about 15 minutes. Thank you. God bless.